situation and circumstance. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord, yeah. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name. Exalt him. Powerful name it is. Nothing, nothing, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of this week about thanksgiving and praise because you know the bible clearly says to make our requests and our petitions known unto god but then it says with thanksgiving so when we pray to god we need to know that he hears our prayers and that he's answering us and once we've prayed and we've asked god we need to thank him and we need to put a praise on everything and praise will go before us and praise will make the way so whatever the feeling, whatever the situation is, we need to believe that God has heard our prayers and that we are receiving it with the thanksgiving and praise in our hearts in Jesus' name. Come on, let's give him a hand clap up for that. Praise you today, Lord. Thank you for the prayers that fall up to your throne. Thank you for the answers, Lord. Praise you for your goodness. Praise you for your kindness. Praise you for your mercy. Father, that you're a good God, that you're a good God. Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Hallelujah. Uh, just a couple of uh, notices here. Someone has very kindly donated loads of pizza. <laughs> and it's in the kitchen. They want to do it anonymously. But there's these big boxes of pizza out there. Enough for everyone. So after the service, not during the service. <laughs> we, can, we, can, <laughs> we can go there and enjoy fellowship together and enjoy the pizzas. I just want to tell you very quickly, we have an evangelism strategy for this church. We'll put it on the uh, platform, but basically, uh, I mean, on February the 18th, uh, there's a Zoom meeting from 7 to 8, uh, praying for our evangelism strategy. We came up with this as, as I met with Joe and Bright. And uh, on the 19th of February, we'll be going to Halsden from 10.30 to 1 p.m to witness and speak to people, pray for people. On the 5th of March, uh, we'll be going door to door in this area, Tokington. And uh, we've done that before in the past with great success uh, from 10.30 to 1 p.m. We'll be meeting here before. And on the 19th of March, we'll be going from 10.30 to 1 p.m. We'll meet here at 10.30 p.m. and then go there uh, to, to Wembley Central. And we'll put that on the platform. and. Uh, yeah, we want everybody to be involved in, you know, us going, 
out together and uh, seeing people touched by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just stretch your hands towards me. Pray for me. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I can do nothing without you, Lord. And uh, I just receive the prayers of the saints right now. Quicken me in body and mind and spirit. And Lord, help me to think clearly, present truth accurately. And Lord, uh, speak to all of us wherever this message goes, even as it goes on YouTube. May it be a blessing to many, I pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Uh, last week, I spoke on hearing God for our lives. Hearing God for our lives. And I want to continue with that theme. And we are we're looking at this theme in uh, the life groups as well. It's very important that you know how to hear God. And it's very important that you do hear God yourself. Amen? If you're not hearing God, why not? We want, uh, God wants you to hear Him. And He wants you to know, uh, you know what He wants to say to you. So uh, I'm going to do a recap on last week. Um, most of you were here last week. Some of you saw it on the on the YouTube teaching, but I'll do a quick recap of what I said last week, and then uh, this week's message is hearing and responding to God. It's sort of like a part two to hearing God for our lives. But you know, in the Bible, there's uh, these periods of time that are called dispensations. There was the dispensation of the patriarchs with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and so on. And then there was the dis dispensation of the law and the prophets, and then there was a we are now living in the dispensation of grace, the gospel dispensation. And uh, in all of these dispensations, uh, one thing that God has said in all of them is that we need to hear His voice. And if we don't hear His voice, there could be very serious uh, implications for not hearing the voice of God and responding to it. So uh, uh, last week we touched on two scriptures, Exodus 15, 26 and Exodus 19, 5 and 6. I'm recapping now. And uh, God says there to his people and he says to us today, if you will diligently heed to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which are brought on the Egyptians for I am the Lord that healeth you. And so there he, he says that we need to hear his voice. And last week I pointed out that a lot of unity that we have in a church or should have in any church is the fact that we all believe what God has said. Amen. We all believe that God has, uh, you know, he's told us to love him with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. We all believe that God's told us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We all believe that God has said a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. And we all believe that God has told us to be forgiving even as he forgives us. We all believe we're called to worship, we're called to prayer, we're called to evangelism, we're called to live by faith. And, uh, and uh, we all believe in spiritual warfare. And the fact that we believe all these truths from the Bible gives us a strong foundation of unity already based on what God has said. Is that clear? You know, and uh, the Lord said uh, to the Jews, he said, you heard me, but you did not believe me. And, uh, you know, it, uh, many times uh, the Bible says, take heed how you hear. It's very interesting also in the parable of the sower, you know, there were four categories of people and they all heard the word. Category one heard the word and then it was taken away from them. Category two heard the word but they didn't respond long term. Category three heard the word with, with great rejoicing, but as time went on, they, they didn't respond to it. And only category four, that's a small percentage, 25% of people who heard the word in the parable of the sower responded and were fruitful. But even though others had heard the word, they didn't respond to it. That's why this week I'm, I've called it hearing and responding to God. It's, so it's not enough to hear him. It's good to hear him, amen? But we then we need to respond to what he said. And then, of course, we have the clear admonition from the Word of God in Deuteronomy and also in Matthew 4, 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the two sources of uh, proceeding from the mouth of God is what God has said. And I gave, we gave the illustration last week. We used Anthony and Paul. And the fact that something had been said six months beforehand, but when it was relayed, the person reacted emotionally, even though it had been spoken six months before. 
when they heard what had been said. And that's the kind of uh, way Rhema works. You hear God speaking to you, and He may sometimes be speaking to you things that He has spoken already in His Word. Amen? So we need to be living by what we hear. You know, there's the, the spoken Word, uh, you know, which the word that has been spoken, and then there's the word that is speaking. I gave many examples. I gave example how I ended up going to Perth because Australia, because God spoke a word to me. And that word that he spoke to me ignited my faith and gave me vision. But then I had to respond to it. And, you know, I, I would tell people God spoke to me to plant a church in Perth. And I told Gary Rucci once, and he said, he, he, he like, you know, I've said this before, I felt like he punched me in the stomach. Boom! And he said, Ian, I've heard you say this over and over again. You know, that you, God spoke to you to plant a church in Perth. When are you going to do it? I said, ouch! <laughs> and so uh, we made plans, and we went to Australia, and we planted the church. And there's more work to be done there. You know, then I spoke about hearing God for yourself. There's a certain dynamic when you're hearing God for yourself. Uh, and uh, I want to touch on, you know, how you handle that. If, if you've heard God say something to you, and everybody around you, uh, those who are close to you, those who love you, think you haven't heard God, then you need to think again. Some people say, I don't care what anyone says. I've heard from God. I'm going to <laughs> Yeah, well, you're going down, you know. God's put people around you to help you. So, the, you know, and when God speaks to you, there, you'll see there will always be a confirmation that will come. And, uh, you know, I want to give you a few examples of that. Then I, I spoke about hearing God for yourself and the dynamic of that. I spoke about hearing God for others. If God gives me a word for Rebecca here, Rebecca, God said, blah, 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 blah. And then uh, Rebecca can take that word away and uh, then she has to test it and uh, she has to feel that God has spoken to her. Amen? So I can't be phoning her up once a week saying, have you done what God told you to do? <laughs> No, she has to decide, she has to decide that God spoke to her, you know, and I, in good faith, gave her the word, but then it's up to her uh, to respond. Amen? So then I also gave an uh, example of hearing God for yourself, hearing God for others, the dynamic of how that works, and hearing God together. I gave the example of, you know, an eldership team and how when I was in Tennessee, God spoke to me about a particular person and said, he will come to England and work with you. God said that to me when I met this guy. I shared that with you last week. And so when I came back, I had to come back to the eldership team that existed at the time. And I said, God wants this man to come from Tennessee and join us in new life. And I believe he's meant to be a leader in our church. But you know, they weren't too happy with me, like I said. And uh, so I had to pray and I had to ask them to pray and they prayed and then uh, eventually they agreed that God had said that but we were hearing God together because when I was in Tennessee they weren't there when God spoke to me they weren't there but we had to talk about it dialogue about it and pray about it and eventually we all came into agreement that this guy was meant to come and he did come and his name was David George who many of you know so uh, I gave those examples and uh, I've said that how God speaks in so many different ways. He speaks through His Word. He speaks through visions and dreams. How many of you have ever had a vision or a dream? Yeah, praise the Lord. God's spoken to me. I don't mean you had a dream about pizza. I mean, <laughs> I mean you, had, you had a dream from God, yes? Yeah, that's what I mean. You had a dream from God and you knew it was God. So, you know, God uh, speaks to us through visions and dreams. He speaks to us through people. He speaks to us through nature. To, he speaks to us through nature. Uh, he speaks supernaturally sometimes through angels and, and an audible voice. And he speaks into our thoughts. And he speaks via our spirit. So uh, when we ended the message last week, we spoke about how uh, when God spoke to Solomon and asked him, you know, ask me for whatever you want. And uh, Derek Prince says, if you read the Hebrew of how uh, Solomon responded. He said, Lord, give me uh, a hearing heart or a discerning heart. And that's in order to hear God, you need to cultivate a hearing heart. If you live from week to week and you don't read your Bible and you don't bother to pray and you watch a lot of TV 
and uh, you know you fill your stomach with food and never fast and, and then it's very unlikely that you will hear God and if you do hear God you probably won't know it is God because he'll be speaking into something that has not been prepared to hear him so it's very important that you know and, and I shared a few thoughts about how uh, our prayer life and Bible meditation and regular fasting uh, helps us to develop what we call a hearing heart amen so let's uh, continue you know like I've said God speaks in various ways there's what God has said and there's what God is saying when I read my Bible in the morning sometimes and uh, a scripture jumps out at me it's God it's what God is saying to me at that particular time but he has said it in the past and now it's speaking to me uh, as a rhema word so you know how can we be sure when God is speaking to us? How can you be sure when God has spoken to you that it is God? And, uh, you know, you will study this in your uh, life groups because uh, the, the theme of the life groups is hearing God's voice and very good teaching from Derek Prince. But there's three things, uh, you know, when uh, in order for you to be sure that God is speaking to you, uh, what he says to you, will always agree with scripture yeah uh, the, the the tenor and the spirit of what you hear will always be in line with scripture if it contradicts scripture then you're not hearing God you know so uh, let me give you the scripture that says that it's 2 Timothy 316 there's a lot of two or three good 316 scriptures you know God so love the world etc and in 2 Timothy 316 it says all scripture is given by inspiration to God. Sorry, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And there, there's one thing, when, when you hear from God, it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit is the one who speaks to your spirit when you hear from God. But the Holy Spirit is also the one that has written all the scriptures. So the Holy Spirit has written scripture and the Holy Spirit speaks. That's why the two will always be in unity. So, you know, uh, when you hear from God, uh, there needs to be the agreement of scripture. And secondly, there's confirmation of circumstances. And sometimes people neglect this. You know, circumstances will often confirm what God has said to you. And uh, let me just give you uh, a couple of examples. You know, uh, you know when Pastor Jim was here, how many of you remember Pastor Jim? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> Jam Shetty <he> says. <laughs> All right, yes, yeah, private joke, no, no, no. <laughs> uh, And uh, you know, when, when Jim left here and he went up to Sheffield and uh, pastoring a church there, and then uh, we had uh, Pastor Chris and, uh, and his wife with us, and they felt a call to go to Abergavenny, where they've been for several years now. Uh, and uh, they went, and you know, uh, there was a gap in our leadership team. So I was praying about who would join me in the ministry. And Pastor Jim said to me, he said, uh, Danny's your man. Ask Danny. Make him the assistant pastor. So I said, okay. And then uh, Pastor Chris said the same thing to me. He said, Danny, why didn't you ask Danny to be your assistant pastor? So I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, so I was thinking about it. You know, I was thinking about it because they introduced a thought to me. Of course, I had thought about uh, Danny. And then I began to pray about it. And when I began to pray about it, I felt uh, that God was telling me to invite Danny to come to be the assistant pastor. Now, God had already called him to the ministry. He was looking to go into the ministry. He, his mom and dad were pastors. And so he already had that desire. But uh, God spoke to me, uh, you know, about it. And then I shared it with a few people. And everyone, you know, felt it was a good thing. And subsequently, that's how he's ended up here as the associate pastor assistant pastor and then associate pastor but you know it was a process and um, you know when God has called someone 
to something, there'll always be confirmation of it. You know, and we shouldn't neglect that. Uh, you know, people who, you live in a body, you live amongst Christians, and you can't isolate yourself. If you, I, it worries me when people say, I hear from God all the time. No, nobody hears from God all the time because we hear in part at the, at the moment. And we, we need each other. Sometimes we need each other to confirm. Not always, but we need each other to confirm what God is saying to us. I don't always look at that because, you know, when I felt a call to the ministry years ago, and I felt it came out of Bible school and I began to feel that God was calling me into the ministry, there were some of my friends that said, well, are you sure? You know, you need to go and get a degree. And you need to, I don't have a degree, by the way. But uh, I have a diploma, but not a degree. So I shouldn't have said that, should I? They were <laughs> but, you know, I felt, I felt uh, this call to go into the ministry. And some of them are saying, well, you need, you know, the Anglican ministers, they go and get a, a BA and an MA and all that. And, they're, and they're, you know, they said, are you sure that God has called you into the ministry? Uh, and uh, I was sure. And uh, I didn't let those negative comments affect me. But later on, um, you know, God called me to go on a fast like I shared last week. And then out of that fast, uh, I was asked to come and preach in this church. And when I was asked to preach in this church, they asked me to be their pastor. And Pastor Coldheart recommended me and sent me here. So you see, there was confirmation from the body. And I ended up in the ministry here. But I wasn't working in isolation. There was confirmation. And you see this in Scripture. Look at Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, uh, there's a well-known passage. You know, I call it the prayer meeting that changed the world. A prayer meeting of five people. And uh, I call it the prayer meeting that changed the world. And it says uh, in Acts 13, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Nigel, Luc Lucius of Cyrene, Manan, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And then having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. Now, Paul, from day one, knew that God had called him to be an apostle. You know, he says that, that God called him from day one to be an apostle. So he was called. And he had an encounter with Christ. And then, you know, he was made blind he heard the voice of Jesus, and then Ananias lays hands on him, and his uh, scales fall off of his eyes, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's many years later that confirmation comes from the body of Christ. And he knew he was called, but here he was. He wasn't an apostle at this stage. He was called to be an apostle, because if you read it, it says there were prophets and teachers. So Paul at this stage was a prophet or a teacher or a prophet teacher. That's what he was functioning in uh, at, the, at the time. He wasn't an apostle yet. In, in Acts 14, when he was sent out to preach, and he went out with Barnabas, and then it says, calls him an apostle. But he was not called an apostle till Acts 14 in, in uh, practice. And so here he is, and he knows he has the call, and then it's confirmed in this prayer meeting of five people. Uh, the Holy Spirit speaks probably through prophecy, and confirms his call. And then they were fasting and praying. They laid hands on him, and they sent him out. And he needed that because he needed the prayer support, and he needed the, you know, a, a support probably even financially to go out into mission. So he needed all that, and all that came through the body of Christ confirming the word that God had given him. Are you following me? So we're not called to live our lives in isolation. We're not called to... Yeah, you know, say, well, God's spoken to me, and then you, you get off me, my back. I'll go and do what God calls me to do, and leave me alone. But I, I find that, that, you know, I go to some countries, uh, I won't mention which, and uh, someone will come up to me, and they have a card. And they say, excuse me, pastor, I'm an apostle. And here's my card. And, uh, <laughs> and then you go somewhere else, and they say, my name is uh, Prophet so-and-so. And they said, I want to give you my card. They're hoping I'll invite them to England. I wouldn't invite them out for a cup of tea. <laughs> and so they come and they tell you that they're an apostle and they tell you that, you know, they've got a wonderful ministry and so on and so forth. You know, in certain parts of the world, 
it's good to be a minister because then you can earn a living. And, you know, people give you offerings and so on. So some people jump in for the wrong reasons. But, you know, if God has called you, no one can stop you from fulfilling that call. No one can stop you from fulfilling that call. You know, and the thing is this, the only person who can stop you is you. If you don't respond, you know. So, um, you know, there's, there's that confirmation that I believe is very important. And uh, there's other examples I can give. You know, like when we started here in New Life and next door, and there was about 12 or 15 of us uh, that used to meet, 1980, 1981. We were, we were a very, very small congregation. And, uh, you know, one day this man comes. He's a preacher from India. Someone told me about him and said he's a very good preacher. Would you like to have him? So I invited him. His name was Dr. Paul Pillai. And I didn't know much about him, but he had a, a good ministry in India. He'd planted hundreds of churches. And he ran, at the time, uh, something that was the biggest Bible school in Asia. Um, later on, there were other Bible schools that got bigger than his. But at one point, he had the biggest Bible school in Asia. I didn't know much about him, but he came. He was very likable, and he preached to a very small congregation. And uh, then he gave me a word. And he said that you will go up and down this country, uh, strengthening people in the world, and you will travel, and you'll do this, and you'll do that. In 1983, I thought, what? You know, here I was. Uh, in, in, a, in a small congregation in the middle of nowhere, and I don't think anybody knew we were here. And there's this guy telling me I'm going to travel, I'm going to go all over. And, uh, you know, it was very encouraging, but it seemed impossible. But as the years went by, I remember going to Malaysia, and I was preaching in Malaysia. There were these two prophetesses there, and they came up and they said, oh, you'll uh, plant churches, and you'll travel, and you'll do this, and you'll do that. And I, I thought, well, praise the Lord. And then my spiritual father said that to me. He said, that, Ian, one day you will have an extra local ministry. In other words, you will travel and you'll preach and you'll do different things like that. And I used to keep getting, you know, this thing that I will plant churches and so on and so forth. And uh, so what, what I'm trying to say is that the call that God put in me, sometimes it can be initiated through a prophetic word, but it'll also be confirmed. And then doors began to open. I didn't... Uh, ask anyone to invite me and I began to get invitations to go all over the place. So you see that confirmation comes of a word that God has given you. But you know, um, you know, a, a, a brother that, whose books I read a lot and I really look up to, he has written a book, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God. That's Kenneth Hagin, Yes. He's written a book. It's a very good book. I recommend that you read it. How to be led by the Spirit of God. And uh, he said that once uh, he got an invitation to go and preach somewhere, this guy, you know, you're going back years, so the guy sent him a letter. And every time he went to write to this guy and tell him, I'm co I'll come and preach in your church, he couldn't finish it. So he just left it. And he tried two or three times to write the letter and say, yeah, I'll come and preach in your church. But he, couldn't, he didn't finish it, so he left it. And then uh, uh, I think the only time in his life that Kenneth Hagin ever went to a hospital because he was, lived a healed life for more than 50 years, but he had a fall and he injured his elbow and he was in hospital. And he said when he was sitting in hospital in the evening, he heard some footsteps coming to the door. And then he said this person opened the door and walked in. He had long hair and a big white robe. And he came and sat next to him, pulled up a chair, and spoke to him for one and a half hours. It was Jesus. He said he got goosebumps, and the Lord walked up to him. And he said he wanted to tell him something, and he wanted to tell him the number one way which people can know that the Holy Spirit is leading them. And the Lord said, you can see me now. This is a vision. This is an open vision. He said, but I'll never lead you like this again. And I want to tell you the number one way in which I lead my people. And so he spoke to him, and he said, you remember uh, that uh, invitation, this pastor came up to you. He said he was preaching somewhere, and he had about 100 invitations. All the pastors came up, said, will you preach in my church? Will you preach in my church? Will you preach in my church? And this one pastor came up to him and said, 
Will you preach at my church? He said, do you go to small churches? He said, I'll go anywhere where the Lord sends me. And so he said, uh, we've only got about 70, 80, 90 people in our church, but will you come? And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll pray about it. And he said, the thought often came into his head to respond to this man. And he would push it aside. And then it came to his mind again to respond to this man who had invited him. And the Lord said, the reason why you couldn't finish that letter is because my spirit was telling you not to go. So you had no inclination to go. And he said, the, the reason why this kept coming to your mind because that small church, he said, I want you to go there. The other church wouldn't accept your teaching. But this church, he said, tell my people that the number one way in which I lead them is through the inner witness of the Spirit. In other words, you pray for something, you pray about it, and then you just sense. You know, when someone invites me to go to a country, I pray about it. And then you either get a red light or a green light. When you, as you pray about it, and you pray about it, so I get an invitation to go to Malaysia, I pray about it, I pray about it, and then I go into neutral. It means I'm prepared to do go or not go. And then I say, Lord, what do you want? And then the desire to go comes, and it gets stronger. And you know that inner witness is the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that is the number one way. Many Christians don't know that. Often God is leading them by the inner witness of their spirit, and they don't realize that God is leading them. Amen? And so you go into neutral, you pray, you're willing to do whatever God wants you to do, and, and He will lead you. And God you know, usually leads you through His Spirit. The Bible says, the Spirit of the Lord bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And when God speaks to you and you pray about something, it'll always get stronger. If God has not spoken to you, if it's a counterfeit voice, uh, you know, because the, the devil tries to counterfeit the voice of God. Some people come up to me and say, you know, I get dreams every night from the Lord. I think, oh no, he needs deliverance. <laughs> Nobody gets dreams every night from the Lord. We, you know. And uh, there was a guy, I was teaching in a Bible school in Hampstead, and this guy came up to me, and he said, oh, Pastor, he said, I had a dream last night, and Jesus came, and he held my hand, and he took me in the garden, and he spoke to me, and he showed me around, and I'm thinking, where is this guy coming from? And he didn't even look like he was saved. But here he was, you know, and he's having all these wonderful visions. And then I heard that he belonged to an occult church. You know, Aladura, one of them. You know, Aladura. And uh, yeah, he belonged to this occult church. So he'd get all these visions that he thought was from God. And he was getting them like regularly. And so I began to pray for him, you know. And he actually invited me to his church. So I got invited to the church of Aladura. <laughs> and I didn't know that it was an occult church. I'm going back years. I didn't know that these guys, they read the Bible, they sang Christian songs, but I didn't know they were occultic. And so I was going there, and then the night before, I talked to Doug Williams, and he said, where are you going? I said, Aladura. He said, they're at occult church. <laughs> I said, oh, no. I said, it's a bit late now, but I had fasted, and I would prayed. And I asked the Lord, and I felt the Lord say, go. So here I am. I'm going to this church. I don't know what to expect. When I go there, they're singing all these hymns. And they're all Christian hymns. But there's no anointing. It's dead. Absolutely dead. And then, you know, um, I think uh, I, I got up and I gave like a... I, I just felt that God told me to go there. <laughs> so I'm watching everything these guys are doing. And then this... Um, I preach. They called me to preach, you see. I had to take my shoes off. Oh, dear. So I didn't mind that because I left my shoes there. And so I preached for about 30 minutes. And then I wanted to give an altar call. I felt the Holy Spirit tell me, give an altar call. So I'm preaching in this church and, you know, like I have preached my heart out for about 30 minutes. And then I hear, you know, give an altar call. So I'm just about to give an altar call and this prophet jumps up. I don't know what rubbish he was talking and he starts shouting and giving a prophecy. And so I, I took it, I said, I, I, and quietly, not out loud, bind you, devil of Jesus. <laughs> God, shut him up. I didn't use those exact words. Lord, stop him. Anyway, he stopped. And then I gave an altar call. 
And about 50-60% of the people in the Church of Aladura came forward to give their lives to the Lord. And I led them, I led them in a prayer. I led them in a prayer and uh, prayed with them and then quickly grabbed my shoes and left. <laughs> but you know. But uh, I were, when I heard that this was an occult church, and then afterwards I told this guy, you belong to an occult church. You know, and he said, it's funny because I'm having dreams and things and these elders are coming to me in dreams. And subsequently he left that church and became a born again Christian. So, you know, that was a, but, you know, we have to sense if the Holy Spirit told me at the last minute, don't go, then I wouldn't have gone, you know, but he, he gave me the go ahead to go there, you know. And um, so in Proverbs 20, verse 27, can we go there? The book of Proverbs 20, uh, verse 27. It's a very uh, beautiful scripture there. 20, 27. It says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. It's, you know, I'm sure you've heard the scripture before. The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inner parts of his heart. And you know, it says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16, listen to this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16 it speaks about the inner man of the heart so uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16 therefore we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing yet the inward man is being renewed day by day so the Bible says that we have an outward man the outward man is your body and the thing what you can see and then we have an inward man and the Bible says the Spirit of God bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. So that, that's why I said last week, you know, some people, they hear prophets and they, they, they see the, how spectacular their ministry is and they start following them all over the place. And I said, that's unbiblical to be running after prophets. You should be led by the Spirit of God, not by prophets, because they don't have the same, uh, you know, stature that the Old Testament prophets had. The Old Testament prophets had the Holy Spirit on them uh, and the people didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. So there was a different setting. Now we all have the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tell the person next to you, you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Amen. And so we can hear God, but it's so important to cultivate your heart so that you've got a hearing heart. And I can honestly say, and uh, Pastor Danny probably say the same thing, you know, uh, that, you know, when you fast, when you pray, when you meditate on the word, and when you uh, spend time in prayer, you know, uh, to know the will of God, uh, you can, those are the times when I've heard him the most. I remember once I was praying in tongues for three hours, and God spoke to me clearly. I just heard it, heard his voice, and I just knew it was him, and he took, gave me some instructions. It's also happened to me that time when God told me to plant a church in Perth, uh, you know, uh, that was I'd been praying for three days and then I became more sensitive to the Lord. You know, there was a businessman in uh, America and he told a preacher, he said, you know, this was in the 40s, he became a millionaire. He didn't have much, but he said, the only reason why I am a millionaire, he said, when I've been given an opportunity to invest, because that's how he made his money, he said, I lock myself up and I pray and I ask the Lord what to do. And he said, sometimes I look at an investment and I think, wow, yeah, I should go for that. But when I pray, the Holy Spirit instructs me. And he said, I've never made a bad decision in my life and I've never lost money. And he was a millionaire in the 40s, you know, like if you had a million in the 40s, that was the equivalent of multimillionaire today. And he said, I don't go make these important decisions. I'm, uh, I've learned from these people because when I've got an important decision or when there's a crisis in my family or situation in my life, I like to go away and pray for a few days and sensitize myself to God and begin to, you know, and often I'll either hear him while I'm there or I hear him afterwards. But that time invested is sowing and afterwards comes the reaping you know so um, you know when you um, how can you be sure God is speaking to you you'll get agreement from the tenor and spirit of scripture you'll also get 
confirmation of circumstances and an inner peace. When God has spoken to you and is telling you to do something, as you submit to it, you'll find peace. I have no anxiety about anything but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We all have the ability to cultivate a hearing heart. So you can hear God for yourself. And if you're not sure, you've got brothers and sisters around you. You've got, you know, when I was called on a 21-day fast, I didn't know what to do. So I phoned a friend. And incidentally, that was David Lamb. I mean, I'm talking 1979. And incidentally, David Lamb is preaching here next week. So he'll be with us next week. Amen. Uh, so I, 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 I went and got counsel from him because he was more mature than me. And I met him, uh, you know, as a graduate when I was in Bible school. And he advised me to go for it and uh, advised me what to do because I'd never been on a long fast before. So, when God has spoken to you, sometimes you may be absolutely sure. Make sure you do what God is telling you to do. You will never regret it. Amen? Amen. When there's a conflict between your will and His will, and you don't want to do it, talk to someone. Get someone to pray for you, a friend or a leader. Say, pray for me. I feel God has said this to me, you know, but I, I, I don't really want to do it. You know, uh, will you pray for me? And so we've got brothers and sisters. Amen? We're not isolated. Uh, none of us have a hotline to God all the time. We need one another. And, uh, you know, God does speak in all the dispensations. He said, hearing my voice is important. Hearing my voice is important. Hearing my voice is important. And remember, that one of the main ways in which you hear the voice of the Lord is when you read Scripture. Because that's all the words that God has spoken. And as you read it, sometimes it'll jump out and speak to you. So you don't just live your life. Listen to me. You don't just live your life by thoughts that come into your head that you feel God is speaking to you. You live your life also through the written word, which God has spoken to you. Because when you read it, God is speaking to you because that's his word. And so we heed to the voice of the Lord. And you know, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says in chapter 28, it's scary. If you will hear the voice of the Lord and do what he says, I will bless you, bless your coming and going. I bless every part of your life. But if you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord, all these things will come upon you. And it's a scary scripture of the things that can go wrong. So it's very important that we hear God's voice individually. We hear God's voice corporately. And that we hear God's voice sometimes if we're in a team. We need to be praying together so can, we can be sure that this is what God is saying to us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, just before we close, you know, I just want to pray for Caroline again. Can you just stand? You know, and I have like a prophetic prayer to pray for you. Uh, and uh, I just feel, I just feel that God is saying that he will heal. I don't, I don't want to make you cry again. But God is going to heal your broken heart. God will heal your broken heart. And some things are just very difficult to understand why they happen and how they happen. You know, but through this negative experience, God's going to enlarge the bowels of your compassion. And you, in the years to come, will have a depth of compassion for people that you've never had before. And, you know, you'll be able to minister to people compassionately because of what you've been through. And, you know, <clears throat> one day God will explain to us why we go through things. But know this, even though it's a negative experience, in the long run, as you put God first, it will be a positive experience in your life. Because God is always a good God. And uh, He's got good things planned for you. And uh, He's taking care of Hadassah. So stretch your hands again towards Caroline. Father, I want to thank you for Caroline and thank you she was able to come here today. It was a nice surprise. Bless her and her family and her son who looks like Johnny. And uh, we just pray that you will bless them as a family and provide for them and lead them into the very best you have for them, Lord. And uh, thank you, Lord, for all your goodness and your provision in Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. I don't know if I should embarrass her. Shall I embarrass you? Yeah, her, her dad is Mr. Motivator. <laughs> Mr. Motivator is her dad. You remember him? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amen. Let's stand together. Come on, let's reach out to the Lord right now. We want to be a people that hears God's voice. Amen. Talk to him. Talk to him right now. I'd like the Pastor Danny to come up here. Also, I'd like Denise to come up here, please. We're just going to have a, just a brief time. Yeah, we'll have that offering in a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just bring your people.